Excellent, Ryan. Live from CRC, it's Tuesday afternoon. Welcome, everyone, to the first session this afternoon and to the best panel of the show. This is a lightning round format designed to be highly pragmatic and jam-packed with value for today's research leader. We will explore solutions being used today in the B2B Insight space with seasoned and accomplished leaders from four market-leading firms. Specifically, several of the leading issues in B2B research execution include reaching challenging audiences, addressing complex value chains, and understanding purchase drivers with multiple influencers. Please feel free to interact with us in the chat to provide feedback. Let us know you're here, roast us, ask questions that we can answer as we wrap up the session. There will be ample time for the panel to address questions, so don't hold back and feel free to send us questions afterwards as well. First up is Adam Hagerman. Adam's team works in both B2B and B2C contexts to understand the dynamics of Indeed's dual marketplace platform to help people get jobs. He is dedicated and consistent in applying cutting edge approaches, and we are fortunate to hear from him today. A bit more complex. Um, and that, that doesn't always transfer over um, when we're working with our internal stakeholders. Um, at Indeed, we're a, we're a job site. What we're trying to do is we're trying to connect people looking for talent with the talent that, that's looking for jobs. Um, on the B2B side, we are working with HR decision makers. We're working with uh, small, medium business owners. We're working with hiring managers who are all trying to find the next great fit for their team. Um, and sometimes we we fall into the trap of thinking that our customer is just that one person who's trying to make make the, the hiring uh, decision. Um, kind of one of the, the fundamental transformations for the, the way we approached Insights is thinking about our customers, one, not just a firm. So this is not just the small and medium business owner, but this is the person. This is Tom, this is Jerry, this is Susan, who is, who is trying to find somebody essentially to join their your little work family. Um, and as we scale up into the larger businesses, it's no longer um, the, the, the HR recruiter at a Fortune 500 company. It's still Tom, Susan, who is trying to do their job and kind of dimensionalizing the, the customer as the person that they are. And then when we're trying to extricate our, our value chain of who um, we should be working with, um, we, we start to realize that our customer is actually several people. So as, as we're trying to serve service, we're not just servicing the, the person who uses or the person who buys. There may be several people interacting um, together as a team, collaborating on different elements of, of the hiring process to find that one perfect candidate. Next slide, Josh. So in, in this, in this, challenge that we had, uh, we were trying to figure out who our customers are. Um, and through that process, we found that it was actually really hard to pinpoint role A does this thing, role B does this thing. Um, rather, it's really a mix. Um, people can hold very similar titles, but be charged with very different tasks. Um, so we, we ended up taking not only a, a persona-based approach, so understanding the, the recruiter, the senior director, the, um, the brand manager, um, or the employer brand manager, um, but we, we also kind of layered on a jobs to be done framework. What is it that these people are trying to do? And what is that inter intersectionality of the roles that they have and the jobs that tr they're trying to do um, and kind of that marriage of their, their holistic identity, if you will. Next slide. Um, and as we were trying to understand our customers, we, we started coming up with um, archetypes in a, in a very, um, segmentation like way um, where we were trying to pinpoint the, these intersectional groups and kind of where they're they're most likely to live so where the roles and jobs intersect and how that layers on on, on different types and sizes of business um, for, for that we we were working with the needs that people may have the pain points they may have in the hiring process or with our product specifically and how they they're using our product what what features or tools are they using within the Indeed platform to get their job done? And with that, we were able to construct a, a number of different archetypes that really um, moved away from this, this siloed view of like the micro business owner, the small uh, business owner, all the way up to like an individual person in the large organization and into kind of humanizing 
the, these B2B people so we can talk to them and create products that, that really fit into their, their workflow. And with that, I think I'm done with my, my two minutes. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much, Adam. Um, next up, we have Kara Woodland. Kara was previously the lead global researcher for Columbus McKinnon and is currently a hardworking and remarkable insights leader at eMoney Advisors. Columbus McKinnon delivers a wide range of lifting and motion solutions, while eMoney Advisors empowers investors. Kara uniquely holds a certified uh, financial marketing professional credential, and I really enjoyed working on a wide range of inside assignments with Kara over the last few years. Kara, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. So one of the most difficult parts of conducting B2B research is really finding that hard to reach audiences. Um, so those are the audiences that aren't really covered by sample panels because either the incidence is really low or you know, even qualitative researchers won't take on the project or only do it on a best efforts basis. So as Josh mentioned, I worked in quite a few industries that have we've had to be really creative to find those hard to reach audiences. So what I'm gonna share in the next few slides is really talk about some of those creative ways that we found them. And then I'll close with a quick case study all in four minutes. So, um, so one of the easiest ways that we're showing here to recruit um, for research is through all those touch points that you have with those who um, touch your product on the way to the customer or otherwise known as your value chain. So these are people like your sales team, distributors, suppliers, even your employees, um, all typically have direct access to the customer that you're trying to research or trying to reach. Or they may even actually be the customer, um, your customer themselves. So next slide, um, outside of your channel partners, um, your internal team also has access to your customers. So marketing channels are a great way to directly touch target customers. You can intercept customers on e-commerce site, e sites and your website. Alternatively, you can post research invitations on social media sites. Indirectly, you can use internal databases from places like customer events, warranty cards, maybe even customer service calls. And then if you don't mind tapping the same audiences used, used in past research studies, um, you, can, you can talk to those folks again too. So in my current role at eMoney, um, go back, Josh. <laughs> there you go. Yep, um, in my current role at eMoney, we started building our own internal panel. Um, so when we conduct internal research, we ask those participants to, if they'd be willing to participate in an ongoing panel. Now you can go to the next slide. <laughs> um, and if you don't have access to customer databases, there are also other options. So this includes going where your target audience goes. Um, we found that associations and conferences to be particularly successful. Um, you can either attend um, and recruit at those events, or sometimes you can get a list of attendees or a list of association members. On that note, there's also industry magazines that will sell you their subscriber list. All you have to do is figure out what other target periodicals or journals that, um, of those that you want to reach. And alternatively, some of these periodicals will actually conduct the research for you. And lastly, you can try targeting companies or titles via social networks like LinkedIn. So now I wanna quickly go and give an example case study of finding a hard to reach audience. So the next slide, thanks Josh. So Columbus McKinnon um, is a company, as Josh mentioned, focused on motion control and overhead lifting. Uh, one of the areas they specialize in is in the entertainment industry. So they help lift all the speakers, the lights, the backdrops for prominent theater productions like Cirque du Soleil um, or entertainers around the world. Um, you probably don't notice it, but the next time you're at a concert, event, or conference, look up. And what's holding up all the equipment, speakers, lights, and backdrops is probably a Columbus McKinnon hoist. So you can go to the next slide. So Columbus McKinnon was an innovator and is the innovator um, in the world of entertainment. They were the first to create an entertainment hoist over 40 years ago. So just to give you a little bit of background, hoists are heavy and they usually start, you know, at or at least a, a mechanical one is around 40 or 50 pounds. Um, and typically a hoist is connected to an overhead rafter or a steel beam with a hook. And then a chain comes down to the bottom from the bottom and hooks onto the object that needs to be lifted up and pulls it up. So before Columbus McKinnon's innovation, a rigger, who is someone who sets up and tears down events, concerts, theaters, things like that, they might be attaching this 40 or 50 pound hoist to a rafter dozens, maybe hundreds of times a day. Um, and before it was even called ethnography, Columbus McKinnon observed these tired riggers at events and saw an opportunity. So they became the first company to create an inverted hoist, where instead of the hook and chain coming out of the bottom, it actually came out of the top. Um, which allowed the hoist to stay on the ground 
And the only thing that had to be carried up to the rafter was the hook and chain. Um, and then they would attach all the speakers and trusses and things like that, and then lift up the hoist along with all the other equipment um, into the air. So you can go to the next slide, Josh. So they were the innovator in the field and they really wanted to stay this way. So the goal was to create a new entertainment hoist that kept them as a leader in the field. However, finding riggers or those who, you know, put all these things together tends to be difficult. They're a transient group. They travel around all the time. They're on the road, you know, most of the year. So therefore we went to where the rigger would be. We went to conferences, we went to events, we conducted in-depth interviews and they're off time. Um, and after the research, we conducted quality uh, function deployment, which is a, an analysis method where we turn the customer needs into prioritized customer requirements and then those customer requirements into technical specifications to create the next generation entertainment hoist. Um, and so the next slide shows the outcome. Um, we found that during the research that riggers and entertainers wanted a hoist that was quieter so that it didn't interrupt or the audience didn't know, you know, there was something moving stuff around. Um, it's easier to fix on the go because these hoists are going up and down, up and down and from, you know, site to site to site and also did very precise movements. Um, all of this allows you as the audience to enjoy a more immersive and sensory experience at an event or concert, probably after COVID, without ever having to look up or wondering how all the stage sets or the effects move so seamlessly. So that's the end of my case study. Hopefully that was within four minutes. I'm going to turn it back over to Josh. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kara. And now we have Tim Brick. Tim Brick is a Senior Research and Insights Manager at Demus Manufacturing. Demus is an innovative international manufacturer of a wide variety of products for consumers, pros, and in white label across a variety of industries. And throughout his 30 plus years in research, Tim has worked at hundreds of companies from mom and pop on up to Fortune 100 companies. And interestingly, Tim has worked on both the vendor and corporate research side to produce phenomenal insights. It's been an absolute pleasure working with Tim. And finally, most importantly, no one is a bigger Packers fan than Tim. On to you, Tim. <laughs> well, we had a tough week last week, but thanks, Josh. Um, and welcome, everybody, this afternoon. Um, what I want to go through today is sometimes you can get lucky by or to reach hard audiences, B2B audiences with your internal network. And I'm gonna use, uh, it's not really a case study, but an example all the way through this. Um, what, we're, what we're gonna use, we're gonna use the new commercial building market. And the first thing you need to do, obviously, is identify the main influencers within that market. Who are the B2B audiences that you wanna reach? Um, well, the architects who design the building are very important because they set up specifications. The large builders are very important because they're building the product and come up with recommendations for the architect specs. And in our case, um, we make plumbing products. So the plumbers or pros are also very important in this mix. And we need a way here not to do um, research with them one time, but to keep or keep talking with them as we develop new products, as we, we alter products, as we add features. And we need to make sure that they're all kept up to date so that when the specs come out, our products can be included into the specs. So in doing so, we have to identify how, how does each of the hard B2B audiences play a part in this? And there's a couple ways to do that. One, initially take a look at some secondary research. In this case, can we take a look at the commercial building industry? Can we uh, decipher how things go? And in this case, it was very mixed. Um, by that, I mean, there was no um, main way that things were getting done. It's more of a case by case basis. So what we need to do after the secondary research is some primary research. And in this case, we did IDIs to talk to each of the groups, the architects, the builders, the plumbers to find out how they play a part within this whole area of commercial building. The last or the next thing, which is step three. Oh, sorry, Josh, go ahead one yet. 
um, which is step three is finding a common denominator in regards to all of your, your uh, audiences that you want to get. This will simplify your effort and make things as easy as possible. Um, so who within your company um, on a daily basis talks with this group or is there anybody? Um, in this case, we knew our internal sales team talks with national reps who in turn talk with wholesalers, which in turn talk with all three as they're bidding on the projects as they're going. Um, so by doing that, you know, how do, the next thing is how does your product get to each of the influencers? Well, again, what you wanna do is formulate an internal team and it may include market development, it may include innovation, it may include, definitely include the sales team. And you wanna find out how your product gets to be part of those specs, gets to be on the front line of the new building that's going to be built in the commercial area. So you formulate that team and you get together and you talk about the best way to do that. Okay, Josh. So you develop a plan. The internal team develops a communication plan. And in this case, as, as I said a little bit ago, what we found out is our sales reps, our internal sales reps have daily communications with their national agencies that have our products and also then work with wholesalers in their area. And the wholesalers deal on a daily basis with, by bidding, by talking with them, by once they have a bid that they're working with them to fulfill the needs. So we almost, we did it all internally by using a little external partner help, which would be obviously the agencies and the wholesalers, but they are promoting our products. They are letting them know when new products are introduced into the market so that they can also be included in the specifications moving forward. You also have to refine the plan, um, adding secondary mechanisms to make it even more uh, um, important and more efficient. Um, you, especially in today's world, we all know that things change and, and who knows what will become the norm for the future. Nobody knows, um, but you have to take a look at the market itself. You have to talk with every once in a while, do some IDIs, talk with that group of, of that audience to make sure nothing has changed dramatically. And, add secondary mechanisms, such as finding out what publications each of those audiences read, when do they read them, how often they read them, and put your ads and things in there that um, let them know also as a secondary part of your new products that are being introduced. That's pretty much all I have. Um, thank you again. Next, we have Keith Hovey. Keith is the Senior Brand Marketing Manager at Genie, a leading Terex brand. Genie is a premier producer of aerial work equipment, and that is industry leading, reliable, and intensely customer centric. Keith has over 15 years of progressive marketing and insights experience managing B2B and B2C products, and he's relentlessly focused on deep insights, quality, and strategy. We're especially grateful at MarTech to have had the pleasure of working with Keith, and we're very fortunate to hear from him today. Thank you, Keith. Hey, thanks a lot. Everyone, thanks again for having me. Um, as Josh said, I'm Keith Hovey, working brand strategy for Genie Construction Equipment. Uh, unfortunately, I, I can't really share the data I was intending to show today due to some uh, competitive privacy concerns, but I would like to use this time to uh, share some of the ways we've used the insights from our recent MarTech research in North America and China to uh, improve both our product development processes internally and externally better convey the distinct benefits of our, our products to our customers. Uh, so to do that, I need to give a little bit of background on Genie. We are a top two player in aerial construction equipment or uh, AWPs. AWP stands for Aerial Work Platform and all of ours are painted genie blue. And if you look at any major job site, you're likely to see at least a couple of them putting workers and materials up in the air to get work done um, more safely, more quickly, more efficiently. Uh, so genie actually started the concept of AWPs 50 years ago. Uh, when our founder was tinkering with this, this compressed air cylinder and, and turned it into a company with hundreds of unique applications. So the reason I say that is I, I want to uh, underscore the importance of um, 
this industry really being born out of innovation, how that's led to kind of where we are today. So like many other companies, our roots have determined the shape of, of our tree. So our founders started this company, again, innovation, innovation, innovation. They, they grew it with a driving force of innovation that guided us. And that, that um, intention of always being on the bleeding edge and conveying that innovation uh, worked its way into our marketing over the past 50 years. So we've historically sold this, this superior innovation story above all else for 50 freaking years, just nothing but innovation at the core. And our marketing really talked explicitly about it because we were really making the assumption that it's because innovation is our focus. It's also our customer's focus. So I've set the stage. So I'll now touch on the actual research um, and how we've kind of uh, shifted our, our strategy as a result. So up until 2019, the scope of our research was really limited uh, to an annual global NPS survey, uh, which, you know, it, it did give us a lot of product specific insights from our current customers, but it was limited to opt-in email responses and it, it really only just in included our current customers. So for us, um, our brand survey project with MarTech was intended to fill some of the middle ground that an opt-in NPS survey might miss. So we had 10 years of data on how our current customers felt about us, but really we were, we were missing arguably the most important piece, um, which is what potential customers who don't buy from us actually care about the most and how they think we perform relative to our competitors in those, those purchase driver categories. Um, so getting to the conclusion, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, so we received literally hundreds of fascinating, actionable insights from uh, our two regional studies with MarTech. Uh, but one of the most powerful was the findings in our stated versus our derived uh, importance questions. And again, I, I, I can't share the specific data with you, with you, which would be really important for this, but I can tell you one thing, that innovation was much higher on our priority list uh, than it was on our customers. So as the industry has grown and reached a point closer to commoditization over the past 50 years, the impact of innovation within the AWP purchaser group has declined. From a stated importance perspective, uh, the number one thing our customers care about is build quality. More than anything else, they say they want a machine that is well-built and uh, well will serve their business with as little trouble as possible. Now, notice that I didn't say innovation in there at all. Um, that's not what they said they cared about the most, and that was really surprising to us. So now switching to derived importance, build quality was still important, which I'd love to be showing you here, but I can't. Um, but um, when you look at just isolating derived importance, our customers really value safety first and foremost. So they didn't say that they did, but when you ask them the pressing questions, it really showed that that's what they really cared about as a, a table stakes game. So after discussing these findings, um, sorry to set that up. So what did we do with this information? So we discussed the findings. Uh, we continue to focus our internal team members on the items that were consistent across both stated and uh, derived importance, price and availability. But we pivoted our innovation development to really focus on safety because it's what drives our customers to buy from us again. But externally, um, in marketing messaging, for example, we've realigned our messaging focus to uh, really directly appeal to potential customers' number one stated purchase driver, which is quality. So at the end of the day, uh, I keep seeing these notices that uh, we need to speed up. So uh, finishing up, uh, end of the day, lots of ways to, to interpret findings from stated and derived importance. Um, we had our own internal debates about it at Genie, but ultimately for us, what we've decided to do is explore the first thing that comes to mind for a customer, which is stated, stated importance. That is the best way to grab their initial attention with marketing messaging, which is exactly what we're doing. Alternatively, the best way to get them to buy again is to address all of the things that they intrinsically care about the most uh, from that derived importance category. So um, with that, I'll give it back to you guys. Awesome. F folks, we're uh, unfortunately out of time. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with Josh and the rest of the speakers. Um, we've got a few minutes until the next session. Um, if you have a chance, visit the Expo Center. There's going to be a bunch of prizes and, and, and points that you can gain towards your engagement score. Um, but please do reach out to the folks directly on the panel with any questions. Thanks, everyone.